back in time, where would you go? We'll put Leslie J. Gordon on the Civil War time machine when we return on Civil War Talk Radio. Have you let your website go stale? Wish you didn't have to wait for your web developer to return your call when you want to update content? You don't have to. Now you can easily and instantly manage your own website content using affordable Avalar technology. Avalar is a website development and hosting company that provides turnkey Internet solutions for companies like yours that need to stay focused on core business. Avalar gives you the power to control your website and make updates and additions in real time without having to learn HTML or other complicated programming tools. Websites powered by Avalar feature capabilities that attract more customers and enhance relationships with existing customers. Avalar offers a multitude of leading-edge solutions, including lead generation and referral tracking, shopping carts and payment processing, membership management, and search engine optimization, to name a few. Take advantage of the full power of the Internet using Avalar technology at www.avalar.com. That's A-V-A-L-A-R. Com. Vitality is a natural expression of health, success, and fulfillment, and yet it's rare to meet people bubbling with vitality. That's because most of us push ourselves too hard, and when we trigger the internal alarms that tell us to change our diets, attitudes, or activities, we ignore them. Allowing outside pressures to override our internal alarms undermines our health, sabotages our success, and limits our potential. If you're ready to reclaim your natural vitality, to begin living a life you love, visit the thevitalyou.com. You're listening to World Talk Radio, where the world comes to talk. To speak with our show hosts or guests during the live show, call us toll-free in North America, 888-514-2100. Everywhere else, call 001-858-268-3068. Jerry Prokopovich on Civil War Talk Radio with Leslie J. Gordon, biographer of George Pickett. When we were speaking just a moment ago, we were talking about uh, soldiers and their wives, their correspondence. I drew a mental blank on, of course, Brigadier General Alpheus Williams, okay. who has a magnificent equestrian statue on Belle Isle in Detroit, the city where I was born and raised. Uh, Williams was the highest it was the most successful person never to get promoted from brigadier to major general in the north. He was better than many major generals, but for, never made the right friends and got, got his promotion. And he's completely forgotten, even by people doing radio interviews today like me, uh, unfortunately. We were talking about the issue of writing uh, and more encompassing types of history, military history that recognizes that the soldiers had identities as husbands and fathers, uh, as well as soldiers. I just let me raise a, a B in my bond and see what you think. One of the problems with social history that became so dominant uh, in, in the profession in the last 20, 30, 40 years was that it was guilty of just the same compartmentalization, but from the other side. That is, if you go back and read what people wrote, people who lived through the Civil War wrote in their memoirs, the one moment they remember in their lives was that wartime experience when they were touched with fire. That's what Mrs. Pickett remembers her whole life. That's what the soldiers remember. It is, the military experience is a critical moment in in anyone's life who goes through it. And in their zeal to marginalized military history, you have too many social histories written where wars come and go without so much as being mentioned. And it seems to me that, that that makes just the same mistake from the opposite direction as those who write about battles without considering the social context. I'm off I, my soapbox. What's your thought? Well, I would agree. I agree with that entirely. I, I know that there are people that teach uh, this sort of U.S. survey courses that it's, it, it's often split in 1865 at the end of the war, and they really won't even deal with the Civil War. They'll, they'll run out of time at the end of the course, and then they'll pick up with the, kind of the end of Reconstruction and get going. Um, and I think that, you know, I know, I know things like, I, I, I think in many ways historians have done a better job with, like, the world wars. Maybe it's because it's it's so hard to, I mean, the, the implications and the consequences of those wars maybe are more obvious. 
I don't know, but you're right. I think it's happened. It's happened with social historians. It's just happened in general. And, and it's ironic that the Civil War gets so much attention and so much written about it, and yet at the same time it, it, it's ignored within the, the sort of profession of history. And it yeah. doesn't get a lot of respect often by other academics. It, it doesn't. It, 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 that the problem is then we leave the field to uh, the historical novelists, to the History Channel, uh, to those who maybe are not trained in the field to tell their versions of the story, which often are the romantic, uh, depoliticized versions. That's right, and it's become a it's a hobby for people. And if you think about it, it it's it's really and I say this to my students a lot. It's really rather troubling to think that the idea of of reenacting people being killed brutally and suffering but that's a that's a weekend hobby. Uh, you know, and, and, and there's no such thing, of course, as Vietnam reenactors. I don't. I, I think that would just be that would just be unacceptable to most most Americans. But there's something about the there's some quaintness to the, the Civil War dressing up and and uh, the women putting on the hoop skirts and the men getting their guns out. There's, there's something very is still sort of entertaining about it. There there are World War II reenactors now. That's true. Uh, one of my students uh, here at East Carolina does that and has talked to me about it. I think my, my late father, who fought in the war, would have been looked a little bit sideways at somebody who wanted to dress up and, and pretend to go through what he went through. Uh, and he certainly would have looked sideways at somebody who dressed up as the enemy, uh, who reenacted German uh, army uh, behavior. Exactly. Whether there is, I, there may be Vietnam reenactors now. You know, I, I don't even know if there aren't. But, but I, I see where, where, where you're saying there. It is uh, the Civil War is distant enough that we can put a, put aside some of the, the negative elements and simply uh, focus on those we're entertained by. Right, right. And I don't know that that's all that healthy for a nation to do that with any part of its history, particularly this vast. A traumatic event in its past. I, I I actually find that rather troubling, that it has become a hobby and sort of and, and literally trivialized in our culture. Uh, when again, I I think the consequences of its aftermath are still with us. I I think that's that's impossible to argue. If you look at the uh, electoral map from the 2004 election and see how the uh, red and blue states correspond to the the blue and gray states. Uh, it, it's hard to argue that the, the, the fracture lines of the Civil War are, are irrelevant today. But let me uh, play devil's advocate and suggest uh, another way of looking at the, the reenacting issue. A few weeks ago on this show, we had uh, Dave Powell, who designs games based on Civil War battles. And you could make the same charge there. He's engaged in a hobby that trivializes this great event. Uh, Dave and, and others, and I'm sure those in the reenactment community, would say they don't trivialize it. They're the ones who study it, who keep its memory alive. And if they waited for those of us in the profession to do it, uh, as you pointed out, some of our colleagues don't even cover the Civil War in their survey course. Uh, if they didn't do it, nobody would. Well, I, you're right, and that that is one of the sort of sort of a mixed blessing of. of of the field that there's so much popular interest and, and as you know you can go out and find folks interested in even listening to this radio uh, show uh, the, the round tables across the country the, the fact that you go into any borders or, or Barnes and Noble and there are just stacks and stacks of books on the Civil War uh, no question I mean I, I feel very fortunate to be in a field where people do want to hear what I have to say or at least maybe they're not going to agree with it but they'll, they, they're interested in it overall um, but like you said, it so so there, there's there, there's incredible interest, and I would never want to say, oh, that's a bad thing. But it's just sort of guiding that interest, and and I think just generally encouraging, uh, whether they're buffs or just Americans in general, to just kind of question the past and think about it critically, and 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 that's just a lesson, of course, you know, as a as a teacher that you often think about with your students. So it's it's just. Um, it is a, an odd kind of situation in that sense, and a lot of my colleagues I know would love to be in this situation too, where they have so much uh, general interest in their topic. That's true. We're, we're here on Civil War talk radio, but there is no uh, Industrial Revolution talk radio or Cult of no. Domesticity talk radio. No. <laughs> uh, it's just us. Uh, and, and it is, as you say, a mixed blessing. It's wonderful to 
share the public's interest in an important topic like this, but it also leads to uh, those who either don't share the interest or share it for different reasons. Let me ask you uh, a question, which I hope will not sound trivial, but I ask many people uh, on, on the show. If you could go back to the Civil War era, uh, spend an hour, who would you want to talk to? Huh. Um, that's a good question. I, I, honestly, I, I guess I would probably go for one uh, for somebody that is kind of an easy pick. It would be Lincoln. Just I, I think I'd probably be incredibly intimidated uh, <laughs> and tongue-tied. But it, I think it would be amazing to sort of be in a room with him, uh, going about his day, or even hearing him give some of his famed speeches, Gettysburg Address, because uh, I do think he had a presence that. It, to me, he is one of those larger-than-life figures that I, I think I think it, it holds true, you know, with all the myth and everything about Lincoln. I, I don't know is, yourself as a Lincoln scholar how, how you'd feel about that, but for me, that I think he'd be the one. I, I think uh, he, he tends to be a consensus choice. Uh, there are a few figures like that in history where you, no matter how much you read, you, you still sense, I, I can't quite grasp what gave this person the, the ability to have the impact that he did. And, and to, to be in the room, to, to sense the aura, uh, would be one way of, of getting closer to that. You mentioned uh, offhandedly you have a current project underway. What are you working on uh, right now? Well, I'm, I'm trying to finish up a, a project that I've been working on for quite a while now, but it's a, it's a different one than uh, anything I've done previously. It's a, it's a, a regimental history about a, a unit from Connecticut. And so I'm dealing with common soldiers rather than famous generals. Um, I'm looking at a group rather than an individual. Uh, and I'm trying to get a sense of these men, not just their experience, which I think is it, it's a rather, rather novel experience, another example of, of stories that don't fit the larger romantic narrative, uh, but also get a sense of what they thought about the war after it happened, how their memories changed. Uh, this is a unit that... Is, it's thrown into battle in Antietam after about three weeks in uniform. They fail, they panic, they run. They say to themselves that they were cowards, and they never get another chance in a large-scale engagement. Uh, they end up captured. This is the 16th Connecticut. They end up captured at Plymouth, North Carolina, sent to Andersonville, and that's their Civil War experience, those two pretty dramatic uh, sort of bookends to, to their story, one Antietam to Andersonville. So... Uh, just be, I've become fascinated by them, and I'm finding way too much material, and I'm trying to put together and, and write uh, in the coming months and, and finish this project up. That sounds absolutely fascinating. There are so many regimental histories out there written by the veterans and modern ones as well, but this sounds like you're taking a different approach. I really am. I, I, I want to bring together a lot of things that have interested me really since my first uh my first sort of explorations into some war history because I, I, I was very taken with stories of the common soldier and I, I actually grew up in Connecticut. I don't have any family that fought in the war, but it is, it's, it's been a, a really different experience to, to explore uh, people that came from the, the same area that I grew up um, and see how, as I said, they really became completely transformed by this, by this experience. And, I, I'm trying to get a handle on the home front. It's been harder to do, just as you said. There's just not as much material, but that's another aspect of it to see how this regiment, uh, how their experiences sort of re were, became, uh, just just how people back home made sense of it as much as the men themselves. I've spent some time reading and writing about uh, the Army of the Ohio and found myself arguing that it was the cohesion of the regiments, the the, uh, the tight bonds that these men shared as they, they served together that really shaped their military experience. Are you seeing anything like that with the 16th Connecticut? Yes, very much, especially because they do, as a regiment, it's, it's, I know it's happened to other units, but not. It, it's still unique uh, that an entire regiment would become captured and imprisoned at the same time. Uh, there's one company that escapes capture, but so you've got about 400 men taken together and experiencing Andersonville together. So that really seals any of that sort of small unit cohesion that was already there. And um, and I, I've found, in fact, your work and Reed Mitchell, some other people that have explored these relationships of, between the men, you know, as a sort of family 
uh, kind of a, a new family for them at the front. That that's all helped tremendously in understanding what happened to these men. And they also c- came together after the war in 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 creating the memory of their unit. And they changed, like like Mrs. Pickett. They they decided deliberately to change the story. Well, no, their their bookends were defeat and then capture, so their story wasn't too edifying. It wasn't, and yet they were able to go back. I think because of Union victory and the post-war attitudes, they were able to go back and recast that whole story too, and make it into, in fact, a sort of story of triumph and survival. Uh, even though they didn't have anything specifically heroic to point to, they they decided that just. Experience just kind of, as I said, surviving what they went through was good enough, and maybe it was. I don't, in any way, mean to say that it wasn't. But it's very interesting to me that that this is how it all comes out. And in the end, they um, they feel that they were just as uh, as brave as as men that fell at Gettysburg. And and it's hard to argue that they weren't. I wonder if is there a parallel to the the POWs of Vietnam, where as a nation we were starved for victory in the aftermath. And we made heroes, therefore, of those who were captured and who, who bore up well under under confinement. But typically, you wouldn't choose your prisoners as your your first choice for heroes. Uh, when there's no choice, that's who you choose. That's a good point, and I've been very interested. I have a lot of diaries from the men at Andersonville, and they are trying to sort this out, even when they're incarcerated. That, of course, they've been stripped of everything that made them soldiers. Uh, except the fact that, of course, they are prisoners of war. But they have no weapons. They, their uniforms are tattered. Uh, they're totally vulnerable, and yet they strive to feel that they're still fighting. And they cling to that identity. Right, right. Well, uh, Professor Gordon, this sounds just like a marvelous uh, uh, work, and I think all our listeners will be eager to see when the 16th Connecticut appears in print. Uh, in the meantime, uh, they can all look forward to reading your biography of George Pickett. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. I hope we can do this again soon. Well, thank you, Jerry. I I really enjoyed it, too. This is Jerry Prokopovich on Civil War Talk Radio.